Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this event marking the world and Europe Day against the death penalty organized by the European Union. I'd like to give the floor to the ambassador of the European Union to the United States, Stavros Lambrinidis, who will give opening remarks. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you, Paul, and welcome to everyone from the US, from Europe, anywhere else watching this. Uh, dear friends, uh, in the European Union, all our 27 member states have abolished the death penalty. We do not use it. Uh, and we're not alone. Uh, in uh, the United Nations, there are close to 200 countries. Uh, over 160 of them uh, did not execute anyone uh, in, the, in the past uh, year. And uh, it turns out that more than 110 of them have abolished the death penalty in law as well. The question, frankly, today is not why are you not using the death penalty, but really, why are you still using it? Now, why is it that the EU has abolished the death penalty? Do we have no crime? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, are we soft on fighting it? No, we're not. Um, in the EU, without the death penalty, we have fought crime tremendously effectively in the past many decades. Um, in fact, there is no evidence to show that the death penalty prevents crime any more than harsh, non-lethal punishments. And in our case, as in most cases around the world, uh, there is no evidence that the abolition of the death penalty actually increases crime. It does not. Death penalty is not uh, a, a necessary, uh, a sufficient, or any type of condition uh, to prevent crime. And this is what we all want to do in our societies. Well, there's another reason as well uh, why we have abolished the death penalty. Uh, we do know that it's being applied in a discriminatory fashion. Uh, the poor people, marginalized people, minorities tend to be the ones who cannot afford uh, the high level and sophistication of legal representation required uh, to, uh, to prove their innocence, especially in capital cases where there's a lot of prejudice going on. And we as civilized advanced democracies cannot allow this to happen. Now, adequate representation, dear friends, matters. And legal representation matters, particularly when it comes to the death penalty because it is an irreversible punishment, the only irreversible punishment. Even if you're innocent and you have been uh, wrongly convicted, if you're executed, that conviction can never be reversed. And frankly, even the best legal systems, such as that of the United States, make mistakes. And we know this, we've seen it. More than 70 from the U.S. alone have been exonerated after new evidence proved their innocence. Had they been executed, this would not have been possible. And I submit to you that democracies such as ours, the European Unions, the United States, have a fundamental obligation, precisely because we are open, free, democratic societies, not only to punish the guilty, but to ensure that we do not punish the innocent let alone when the punishment of the innocent can be irreversible, such as in the case of death penalty. Adequate representation matters as well, because even in states in which the death penalty is being applied, there are international and local legal rules that prevent people from being executed if they are minors, if they are not of mental capacity, if the means of execution are cruel and unusual. That is where lawyers come in. And that is where my pride for today's event is particularly heightened, because we have with us two of those lawyers at the forefront of habeas corpus cases in death penalty situations, Ruth Friedman and Paul Botte. And yes, let me just say that both of them are dear friends from uh, our joint uh, Yale Law School days. It's a great honor to have you here. And Sharif Cousin, an exoneree from Louisiana in 1999, he was convicted 70 years, wrongly convicted, was exonerated, is thankfully with us today as well. Uh, what an honor to have you with us. And uh, Robert um, uh, Durham as well of the uh, Death Penalty Information Center, thank you for being here. Dear friends, you may say, oh, this is okay, but what about the victims? What about their families? Don't we feel the need for revenge? Do we like those killers, those murderers, those violent criminals? My answer is no. 
No, we hate them. But the question that arises is not just their dignity, but ours as democratic societies. I submit to you that we cannot allow a killer to turn us into an executioner. That is our dignity that is in line. That is our dignity that we have to protect like major societies. So we were very concerned and disturbed as European Union when the US this year reinstituted federal executions. We were open in criticizing that. We look forward to the day where the increasing number of US states, more than 50%, who have abolished the death penalty in law and in practice, are joined by more and more. Our work here is to achieve this. Our work around the world is to ensure that lethal injections will never come out of the European Union to go to any place that executes, and we have banned them. Our work is to ensure, as European Union, that we work with other countries in order to ensure that instruments of torture can never be exported and used for torture or for the death penalty, and we have achieved it. And my hope is that we will be able to celebrate very soon together with the American people, the abolition of the death penalty in the United States as well, at all levels. Keep in mind, keep in mind, public opinions change. They always do. And in the U.S. today, a majority of people are indicating that they think that life in prison should be and is a more effective punishment than capital punishment. Let's work together to get this done. Thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure for me to also have present today the ambassador of Germany, Emily Haber. Germany, as you all know, holds today the presidency of the European Council. Thank you, Ambassador. Now, the ambassador of Germany to the United States, Emily Haber, will deliver remarks on behalf of the German presidency of the Council of the European Union. You have the floor, Ambassador. Thank you and good morning, everybody. Welcome from me too to today's event on death penalty. And thank you, Ambassador Lambrinidis. Thank you, Stavro, as involved uh, uh, for putting this event together. As you've heard, Germany has taken over the presidency of the Council of the European Union in July. And the job of a presidency is to drive the EU's agenda. Now, strengthening Europe's fundamental values and rule of law is one of the elements Germany is focusing on. The fight against the death penalty is a core element of these values. The EU has, is opposed to the use of current under any circumstances, and we are committed to abolishing the death penalty worldwide. Now, let me quote two sentences, two opening sentences uh, of the European Fundamental Rights Charter, which entered into force in 2009. And it says, everyone has the right to be treated with dignity. Everyone has the right to life. And the death penalty is forbidden. These are two proud sets that apply to the entirety of the European Union. Yet they've been in force only for a decade now. Europe's position on the death penalty had changed over the decades. It took a while until the whole of the European Union and its member states agreed on the outright rejection of the death penalty. The European Convention on Human Rights, which was drafted in 1950 and includes non-EU member states, today cites for lawful executions as an exception to the right of life. And in divided Germany, we had, until 1989, a totalitarian communist regime in the East, the German Democratic Republic. And there were 164 executions in East Germany during its existence. Until 1968, those condemned were beheaded by a guillotine. After 1968, they were shot from behind. Executions were never made public. The last execution in the GDR occurred in 1981. The prisoner was a state security captain and he was called Werner Teske. His crime was a plan to flee Germany. In 1987, two years before German reunification, 
the GDR formally abolished capital punishment. Secretary General um, Erich Honecker had feared his image prior to his first and only visit to West Germany, the class enemy. So he abolished the death penalty just before traveling to the West. In West Germany, the death penalty had long been abandoned. The ban is enshrined in the constitution, which was adopted in 1949. For us as Germans, this was one of the key lessons of the Nazi dictatorship. Nazi Germany used the death penalty instrument of its racist, totalitarian, anti-Semitic policies. And our clear conviction, our clear position today stands at the end of a historic process that was to a large extent also triggered by the horrors of the Holocaust and lawless totalitarianism on European soil in the 20th century. It was the United States that helped us to overcome this dark past and to reestablish democracy and the rule of law in Germany. And it therefore saddens me this summer to see a partial revival of the death penalty in the United States under federal law. At the same time, as Stavros has pointed out, we see an encouraging trend at the state level. 22 states have abolished the death penalty and three states have imposed a moratorium on executions. I hope that one day the United States as a whole will join the historic process to abandon the death penalty. We don't miss the death penalty. There is, as Ambassador Lambrinidis has underscored, no scientific evidence to support the view that capital punishment works as a deterrent of crime. There's also no evidence at all that abolition leads to an increase of crime. And yes, we stand by the victims of abhorrent crimes. We stand by their families, but we do not believe that the death penalty does justice either to the memory of the victims or to the dignity of our societies. The punishment makes wrongful convictions irreversible and such miscarriages of justice can happen in any legal system, no matter how advanced. We've heard it uh, in the US, almost 200 people on death row were later exonerated after they had been found guilty initially. We have to admit that humans can err. This alone is reason enough to abolish capital punishment. So as we mark the world in against the death penalty, let me conclude by underscoring the sentiments expressed in the title of today's film. Just mercy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Lambrinidis and Ambassador Haber. We will now move to the panel discussion and I will start by briefly introducing the speakers. I also want to encourage the audience to submit their questions by using the Q&A chat feature in Zoom. And there is also a possibility to ask questions directly by speaking into a microphone. You can use the hand raise function in Zoom and I will give you the floor. We have today with us Sharif Kuzan, who has spent three years on death row in Louisiana for a crime he did not commit. Sharif was 17 when he was sentenced to death, making him the youngest person ever sent to death row in Louisiana. In 1999, he was exonerated, and in 2005, the prosecutor in his case was disciplined for misconduct. Sharif is a member of Witness to Innocence, where he fights for compensation for the wrongfully incarcerated. Paul Botte is an assistant federal public defender who represents death row inmates in federal habeas corpus proceedings. For over three decades, he has been counsel for death row inmates in Texas, Tennessee, and Ohio. Robert Dunham is an attorney and a nationally recognized expert on the death penalty. Before becoming the executive director of the Death Penalty Information Center in March 2015, he was one of the leading capital appellate lawyers in Pennsylvania. Robert has 25 years of experience as a capital litigator and a teacher of death penalty law. And last but not least, uh, Ruth Friedman is the director of the, death of the Federal Capital Habeas Project. The project was created to recruit, train and consult with qualified counsel and otherwise improve representation. Uh, until uh, 2002, Ruth served as a senior counsel at the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama, where she represented capital defendants in federal habeas corpus state post-conviction, post direct appeal, and trial proceeding. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Sharif, Sharif maybe we can start with, uh, with you. More than 170 persons have been exonerated from death row in the U.S. since the 70s. 
To put that in perspective, that means one person for every nine executions. This was the main topic of the movie, Just Mercy, that I hope the audience had the chance to, to watch. You were sentenced to death when you were only 17 years old and then exonerated three years later. Could you please tell us about your experience, how you ended up in death row, and why did you decide to become an advocate against the death penalty? Thank you. Uh, so I, I just start by saying, uh, you know, even from the movie Just Mercy, I remember a quote uh, by Brian Stevenson uh, when he said that if we all just look at ourselves, uh, that we all need justice, we all need mercy, and we all need just a, a measure of grace. And that really caught with me because I don't have to talk about the, the legalities or, or the the numbers or the, about the death penalty. We all know that. Um, but what never is talked about is the trauma that a lot of us who are, have experienced death row and have been exonerated still face today. Uh, I was arrested when I was 16 years old. Uh, and I was at a basketball game that was on videotape uh, at the time of the murder. And I've had 20 witnesses, other kids uh, that were playing basketball with me that were there to testify where I was at the time of the murder. And I, I never tell people that I was wrongfully, I don't even like to use that word in some sense. Uh, I like to correct it and say I was actually framed because the police department and the DA's office conspired uh, to put me on death row when the evidence uh, showed that I was innocent. But just being on death row as a child, I, at the time, I was 17 at the time, I was the youngest person in Louisiana on death row at the time. Uh, just being there as a child and at 17, you should be thinking about your high school prime or you know what your high school graduation or what you're gonna do you know, with with the next years of your, of your life, there's no reason why a child should be on death row thinking about whether or not he's going to live or die. Uh, and there's other men actually executing, befriending other men and looking at the human aspect of everybody, not not uh, that crimes were uh, what they were accused of on death row, but just being in a situation and knowing the human person uh, it was very traumatizing for me. Uh, and I'm 41 today. And every time I, uh, uh, I'm, I'm reading about death row situations or seeing another story, I would never put that situation. It's with me forever. And, and 20, 20, 20 years later, uh, uh, still trying to figure out who I am, you know, things that I enjoy doing. Uh, things that make me happy, uh, being social with other people. I have I have children, and it just that situation. Honestly, it just it's it's made me broken to the point where uh, uh, I'm uh, you know I have I get counseling, but I'm still emotionally unstable. Uh, so I think just being on death row it made me angry to the sense where uh, not to the sense where like what I've gone through and what I had to experience, I, I never wanted to go in vain. And so I'm fighting uh, for the abolition of the death penalty because it's the right thing to do. And when, when we look at it, uh, I'm number 77, the 77 person have been examined in death row. Um, and I never want to be labeled as a number, unfortunately, that's who I am. That's what I am, number 77. Um, and uh, uh, I'm fighting for the abolition of the death penalty because if I have the media and other folks fighting for me, then I wouldn't be here. And I know that the hundreds and the thousands of individuals that are sitting on, on death row in America, if we execute any one of them and then find out they were innocent, it's too late. And I sit here because I could have been an individual. So anything I can do, anything that I can do to share my story, anything that I can do to shed 
and education to this situation, then my life and, and my situation hasn't gone in vain. Thank you, Sherry, for sharing your, your story with us. That is a very powerful uh, testimony, and you raised a very important point, that is the human consequences of the, of the death penalty. Uh, Paul, let me turn to you now. As a criminal defense lawyer, you obviously know the system very well, uh, and the U.S., as Ambassador Lambrinidis and Ambassador Haber have mentioned in the remarks, has one of the most advanced legal systems in the world. Many people who are, many of those who are in favor of the death penalty argue that if someone is sentenced to death, it's because it's proven that they are guilty. Yet, as we have seen, mistakes do happen. Uh, could you please tell us more about some of the specific issues leading to wrongful convictions that you have encountered working in, in capital cases? Certainly. Oh, one of the great challenges in capital cases is that they are so incredibly complex and people don't maybe real recognize how complex they are. And it's only when the system works flawlessly uh, and uh, that the that convictions and sentences can be fairly imposed in, in the United States. And unfortunately, what we see is there are too many areas within the system where flaws do occur on a daily basis. Uh, and as a result of that, folks who do, don't deserve the death penalty and folks who are innocent and don't deserve the death penalty end up on death row. So how does that happen? Um, Sharif, we're very grateful for the fact that you have been able to uh, get past the, 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 the framing and wrongful conviction in your case, which only took three years. Unfortunately, what we see in so many cases is that law enforcement can overreach in the cases where people get wrongfully convicted or put on death row. Uh, prosecutors can overreach as well. Uh, prosecutors have a constitutional and ethical obligation to ensure justice. Yet, unfortunately, so many of the cases I've worked on over the years have been situations in which the prosecution has withheld favorable evidence uh, for uh, for the defense that was never presented. So in cases where law enforcement overreaches or the prosecutors don't do their job properly, you can get the wrongful conviction and somebody improperly on death row. There are also issues about jurors. Uh, jurors have an unenviable task of trying to sort through the evidence in cases to figure out what the truth is. Sometimes they get misled. Sometimes they, they can't do the job properly because they're not given the evidence that they need. Um, and jurors also have to tell us the truth when they're being selected for juries. And as folks may have seen recently, the, the Boston bomber case got reversed because jurors weren't being honest in their answers to the questions during the jury selection. Uh, questions about witnesses, so much we've learned in the past couple of decades about what purported to be science, the science of arson, the science of shaken baby syndrome, uh, and various other areas of science, ballistics, firearm identification. Turns out it's really not as scientific as folks have said it is, and people have gotten convicted and sentenced to death based upon inaccurate uh, scientific evidence, which was proposed as scientific evidence, but turns out to be not scientific whatsoever. Um, then ultimately, I think, uh, and, and the ambassador uh, spoke about this as well, one of the great challenges is the, the level of counsel that people receive. Uh, fortunately, some folks have received excellent counsel like Sharif did and was able to get his case overturned in a matter of years. Other people have had Brian Stevenson, other folks have had Ruth Friedman, but the plain fact is the quality of counsel ranges dramatically from state to state, from city to city, and usually in the cases in which uh, individuals are getting improperly convicted or uh, erroneously sentenced to death, those are situations in which an attorney uh, either doesn't have the experience or maybe has the experience but is overwhelmed by the case because these cases are so incredibly complex. And at least in my experience, when I start looking at cases years and years after convictions and sentences, five, 10, 15, 20 years later, almost inevitably, we will see issues that have never been raised that are valid issues that can be um, grounds for relief. Uh, so th those are the, the main issues on which we, we see uh, 
problems of wrongful convictions and improper death sentences, law enforcement, prosecutors, jurors, witnesses, and counsel. And unfortunately, we often see that it's not one of these problems that exists in the cases where people are wrongly convicted or sentenced to death. It's the perfect storm. One or two or three or four of these problems all exist at the same time. And then there's the great challenge of how to get the courts to listen and to grant relief and grant people like Sharif new trials. Thank you. And very linked to this is another important flaw of the death penalty, that is that it affects disproportionately the minorities, the poor and the vulnerable and people that cannot in general afford a quality counsel, as Paul was saying. Uh, racial bias is an issue that has been at the center of the debate this year, particularly in relation to the criminal justice system, the system and it was also prominently featured in the movie Just Mercy. Uh, Robert, your organization, the Death Penalty Information Center, has just released a report on race and the death penalty, entitled Enduring Injustice, the Persistence of Racial Discrimination in the U.S. Death Penalty. Could you please uh, tell us some of the main findings of, of your report in a couple of minutes? Thank you. Sure, it'd be my pleasure. First of all, uh, thank you to the European Union and the ambassadors for holding this important event. Um, we wanted to do three things with our report. Uh, we wanted to first put the death penalty in the United States in its appropriate historical context. We wanted to look at the death penalty itself, the way it's currently administered, uh, to examine where and how discrimination occurs. Uh, and we wanted to show how the death penalty fits into the national reckoning on systemic racism in the American legal system uh, and explain why any serious efforts at reform have to include seriously restructuring or ending the death penalty. First, when it came to history, uh, we looked at the death penalty from colonial times through the time of the Civil War era, Reconstruction, Jim Crow uh, segregation, uh, and up to the modern times. And what we found is that the death penalty is a direct descendant of slavery, lynching, and segregation, uh, that it reinforces the same racial hierarchies uh, that the law openly promoted in the past. Uh, you can't look at, you can't understand the death penalty in the United States if you don't understand the history. Uh, and when you see the disparities in the way in which the death penalty is administered, uh, you can't look at those numbers uh, without first seeing how they evolved from uh, legal discrimination in the past. Uh, what we found, though, when we looked at the current practice, is that rather than the death penalty um, having a race problem, the modern death penalty is itself a manifestation of America's systemic problem uh, with the criminal justice system and race. The discrimination starts at the policing stage. Uh, it continues through charging practices, through jury selection, convictions, death sentences, appeals, and on through executions and exonerations. Uh, in fact, what we found is uh, that people of color are more likely to be exonerated uh, because they are more likely to be framed, more likely to be wrongfully convicted, uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, from a proportional perspective, uh, they are disproportionately executed. Uh, we find that racial discrimination shows itself in two major ways. Uh, first, the question of whose lives matter the most, uh, and that is measured uh, by what cases prosecutors seek the death penalty. What we see is that prosecutors overwhelmingly seek the death penalty uh, disproportionately in cases involving white victims and particularly white female victims. Those lives, they say, matter more. Uh, and that is explained in part because the fact that virtually all of the prosecutors in the United States who are making decisions on who should live or who should die, whose life whose lives should be taken, who should be subjected to the death penalty, virtually all of those prosecutors are white. It is now 95% uh, of the prosecutors who are making those life and death decisions. It may be a product of overt discrimination in some cases. Uh, it may be framing people, as we saw in Sharif's case, uh, or it may be a question of implicit bias because the data now shows and social science studies now show that the hardwiring of the American brain, uh, Americans actually perceive race differently. Uh, and so they, those, who, uh, those who are most um, anti-black in their perceptions uh, are the ones who are also most favoring retributive justice. Uh, and those uh, who, uh, who 
think of whites are more likely to think in terms of mercy. So when we have discretionary acts deciding whether somebody should live or die, we see that they are disproportionately exercised so that the, the discretion to grant mercy uh, goes to white defendants uh, and the discretion to take people's lives tends to go to African-American defendants. The system is based on whose lives matter the most uh, and the answer to that has been white lives. Phrased differently, you are more likely, you are most likely to be capitally prosecuted, most likely to be convicted of a capital offense, most likely to be sentenced to death, and most likely to be executed if you are a black man or woman who has been convicted of killing a white man or woman. The third thing we wanted to do was to place the death penalty in the context of the overall criminal legal reform movement uh, in the United States. Uh, and we found, and I don't think this should be a surprise, uh, that no county that abusively employs the death penalty is fair in everything else that it does. Um, and so you need to address the death penalty if you're going to be serious about overall criminal legal uh, reform. Uh, its mere presence justifies other harsh punishments. And if you tolerate discrimination in the way in which courts take somebody's lives, you are much more likely to tolerate abuses by police in killing civilians. You are much more likely to tolerate abuses uh, in stopping and frisking people, uh, in pulling people over for car stops, in a whole range of exercises of uh, non-legal, non-judicial non uh, discrimination. Uh, and everything that is bad in the criminal legal system is worse in the United States when it comes to capital punishment. If you want meaningful reform, you can't ignore the head of the snake. So that's basically what we found. Uh, and we're hopeful that when we do have uh, a national reckoning, uh, when the country does start uh, seriously considering uh, criminal legal reforms, uh, the death penalty will be at the center of those discussions. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. Those are some very interesting findings. Let me now turn to, to Ruth to discuss another topic that has been raised by, by the, in the opening remarks by Ambassador Lambrinidis and Ambassador Haber, uh, that is the federal death penalty. The federal government, as many of you know, has recently resumed executions after 17 years hiatus, and you, Ruth, represented one of the, the first, actually, he was the first inmate executed by the federal government since 2003, Daniel D. And you have also extensive experience working in, in federal capital cases. Could you please uh, talk about your, your job at the federal level and, and about this case? Thank you. Certainly. Um, I want to thank the European Union for holding this event and um, for inviting me to participate in it. Sadly, um, what we've heard so far from um, Mr. Kuzan, most painfully, and from um, uh, Paul and Rob, who I know well too, uh, as well, um, this unfortunately is applicable to the federal death penalty. It is as it is to the states. Uh, I, when I started this program, I uh, working on federal capital cases. I didn't know that I would come to see exactly the same problems replicated throughout the federal system. Um, racial bias is endemic, unfortunately. Uh, uh, African Americans are widely disproportionately uh, represented on the federal death row, as are people of color generally. 45% of our row is made up of uh, African American men. Um, uh, we, we haven't talked that much about geography, but it's a very similar problem. The federal death penalty covers 50 states and um, the territories in the District of Columbia, and yet three states alone make up almost half of the row, which says something about how these cases are chosen to begin with. Do we believe that those three states, which are um, Texas, Missouri, and Virginia, have the worst crimes and the worst of the worst offenders? When you start digging into the way these cases work, you see that um, the same problems replicate themselves over and over. Um, council has been discussed. Council, um, there are problems in every case, as Paul Bote was discussing, and there are problems in the federal cases. 
One difference may be that more resources are given, certainly than when I worked in Alabama, but the same problems appear in each of these cases. Uh, you have lawyers who are may mean extremely well, but don't have the background, don't have the ability to represent people uh, in these cases, particularly when it comes to habeas corpus proceedings, which uh, our law and the government, the courts have made extremely, extremely difficult to follow. So you mentioned um, the federal executions. There have been seven so far this year. Um, that means the federal government has executed as many people as the rest of the country put together um, so far. And uh, there is another one slated to be, um, another man on federal death row slated to be executed next month. Um, this is all happening during a pandemic, unfortunately. Uh, which will you see so many of the states um, slowing down their apparatus or recognizing that bringing many people to one place is not a healthy thing to do or doesn't follow the CDC guidelines, uh, but the federal government is continuing these executions anyway, or restarting them as, as people have said. Um, my office represented Daniel Lee. Uh, Mr. Lee was the first person executed by the federal government after the resumption of um, executions after 17 years. And I would like, I'm glad to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about his case, because again, it is so indicative of what the problems are. Um, Mr. Lee's case, we took on this case after he had completed his appeals, which I will speak to in a moment about why that's so important. But when we came on, um, we found a lot of problems and uh, information kept trickling out. Uh, about his case that really should have been um, released many time, many years earlier. But one thing I want to know from the start about this case is that when the execution was announced, uh, the execution date, the victims of the crime, the prosecutor, the lead prosecutor who tried the case, and the judge who presided over his case, the co-defendant's case, and their, both of their post-conviction proceedings all came out against the execution. Now that's unheard of. Um, in you know three decades of doing this work, I'd never seen anything like that. And you would think it might ask the government, but among and us as well, why is that? What, what is it that made people come out against this execution? Well, to start of start with um, is the question of arbitrariness, and that is something you will see throughout the penalty systems in the United States. How did this person get to be chosen to be the one to be uh, sentenced to death and executed? Um, you know, Mr. Kuzan showed exactly how it happens in some cases. And the arbitrariness, in his case, framing, in other cases, um, there are lots of different reasons for it. But here, one clear reason was the difference between um, Mr. Lee and his co-defendant. Um, we talk about, and the death penalty is defended in terms of being used for the worst of the worst. Well, here in this case, the prosecution said from the beginning of the trials, the co-defendant was the leader. The co-defendant was the instigator. The co-defendant was the person who killed the child in this case. It was a child victim and three victims. Terrible crime. The government defended choosing Mr. Lee for um, execution on the basis that it had to be done for the victims and that there was a child victim in this case. Well, first of all, the government itself throughout said that Mr. Lee was not responsible for the killing of the child victim. And certainly in this case, we saw, saw throughout the victims were against, the victim survivors were against the execution. Um, throughout the case, uh, the prosecution said that the co-defendant was the leader and our client, the sort of, what they call the faithful puppy dog, the person who followed him. Um, this was their evidence, not the defense evidence. This was, this was their case. And that was a main reason why the victims and um, the other people who were involved in the case, who brought the prosecution, felt that this outcome was unfair. It was so clear throughout the trial that when, um, when the death sentencing hearings were started, and death penalty cases were done in two different trials, the first one to decide whether the person is guilty or innocent, and the second, the sentence. When it was time when the when the co-defendant was um, his sentencing was being held. The prosecution came and said, "Look, we think that if the co-defendant, Mr. Kehoe, is found to have um, is, is sentenced to life without parole, 
that we think that we would like to drop the death penalty against Mr. Lee because it would be inappropriate for him to get it as well. And they polled the victims in the case, all the case agents, the FBI, and everybody agreed that that would be appropriate. But they went to um, the main justice, to the head of the Justice Department at that point, and were told, no, you have to go ahead. And so they did. I mean, one moment of you'd think, so Mr. Lee would be alive if that decision hadn't been made. So what happened after that? Well, let's look at his death sentence. How did he come to get a death sentence? Well, the government, his death sentence rested on two pillars. One, a psychological instrument, and I think it was um, uh, Paul Boutet who talked about junk science, a psychological instrument that purported to predict um, who would be a future danger, who would cause violence in prison. That was one pillar. Well, it turns out the um, government expert who uh, gave this test to Mr. Lee later disavowed its use completely in capital cases, said it has no valid prediction for who's going to be a, um, a future danger in prison, um, which, of course, Mr. Lee turned out to not be any danger in prison whatsoever. Um, uh, and, and yet that was the one basis for his death sentence that stayed till the end. And the other was that the government argued at trial that uh, Mr. Lee, when he was a child, when he was 17, had committed a murder. And what's more compelling to a juror deciding life or death in a death penalty case to say that someone had done this before? It turns out that's not true. He did not commit a prior murder. He committed a prior robbery. The um, Oklahoma authorities where this case had happened when um, Mr. Lee was 17, uh, had overcharged him and tried to charge him with a murder. And the judge at the time said, you can't do that. You don't have any evidence to support it. You need to dismiss it. Well, the jury didn't know that. They only knew that he had um, allegedly been responsible for prior murder and that the government had, out of their largesse and grace, um, let him plead to something lesser. So both of these pillars are completely false. When we came onto the case, we tried to litigate both of them. We tried to say, you can't execute this man. Neither of the reasons for the, that, that you're executing him are true. And the government did not, um, that's the US government in this case was the prosecution, didn't even defend the bases. They said, it's too late for you to come into court. Procedural roadblocks prevent you, prevent a court from litigating, considering, adjudicating these issues. And so that's what happened. These issues could not be um, ruled on by the courts. I don't think people realize, you know, sometimes I tell the story of what happened to Mr. Lee and people say, well, that's not right. That can't possibly be true if the, um, the test was uh, junk science and there was no prior murder. But it is true because our laws do not allow or allow the prosecution to say, do not look at this issue, do not decide it. You know, in addition to the, um, the victims, the prosecution, and the judge being against this, three different judges who tried to look at these issues when we brought them before them said, there's a problem here. Um, we think that this sentence violates the Constitution, but I can't reach the issue. I'm blocked from reaching it. Um, and these were not, as is sometimes talked about these days, you know, liberal judges, though I don't think we should be looking at our judiciary that way. They were Republican appointed judges who had really real problems with this sentence. And yet there was no way to reach it. Um, I should also add when we were, when this information was trickling out, what also trickled out was that the main other suspect in this case, um, it turns out, had failed a lie detector test that was um, administered to him by law enforcement, never told to the uh, prosecution, I mean, I'm sorry, to the defense, learned about it um, when we were representing Mr. Lee. And again, it couldn't be looked at. There was no, no way. Um, even though the prosecution, when that man testified at trial said, there's no evidence against him. There's no evidence. It's a smoke screen. There's no evidence that he had anything to do with this crime. Um, that's the case that the prosecutors chose to, um, make the first execution um, in this country by the federal government in 17 years. Um, 
And to me, that is an indictment of our system. And it could go on and on. There's many more things I could talk about, including the way they executed uh, Mr. Lee, which the media covered as well. Um, people talk about the federal death penalty as a gold standard. There is no gold standard. There is no comfort in seeing um, cases like that be what we are supposed to defend as a country for the use of the, of the death penalty. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth, for, for going into so much detail to, to tell us the, the story about the, the case. Uh, another, another issue that you have all touched upon is that uh, in many cases, the, the death penalty uh, and the research from the Death Penalty Information Center and other organizations have also shown that the death penalty is somehow in decline in the U.S. by the number of states that still use capital punishment and the new, new death sentence and also number of states that, that still use the death penalty. But on the other side, the, the federal government has resumed executions. Do you, do you think that there is a reversal, a reversal on this trend, on the, on the decline? I can ask Robert maybe to answer, but Sharif, if you want to jump in, or Paul, or, or Ruth, welcome. Well, let me start with some of the numbers, um, and then we can hear from, uh, from other folks. Uh, is the death penalty coming back in the United States? Is this a resurgence of capital punishment? I think the clear answer to that is no. Uh, the federal government has executed more people in the last three months than it had in the previous 60 years combined. And at the same time, the rest of the country is going to have the fewest executions in 37 years uh, since 1983. And there will be fewer new death sentences imposed this year than in any other year since the death penalty resumed in the United States in 1972. Now, the coronavirus has a lot to do with this, but even before then, we were on track to have our sixth straight year of fewer than 50 new death sentences and fewer than 30 executions. That's a decrease of 85% in the number of death sentences since the 1990s uh, and a decrease of 75% when it comes to execution. So the federal government is completely out of step with the rest of the country. What you have to understand is the way the criminal legal system works in the United States. The federal government is just one of uh, the many different jurisdictions uh, that enforce the criminal laws. And you should think of the federal government's policy the way you think of any other state. Uh, what we see is that the death penalty is declining one state at a time. Uh, we now have 22 states that have abolished. 15 of them have done so, um, I'm sorry, 10 of them have done so in the last 15 years. Uh, and even within the states, uh, the use of the death penalty is in the on the decline. It's enforced at the county level. Uh, and a new analysis that we are just about to complete uh, is going to show that more than half of everyone on death row in the United States comes from just 1.2% of the counties. But the death penalty has disappeared from whole regions of the United States. It's declining in the states that still have it. What we see in the federal government is that uh, this particular uh, administration uh, is an outlier that's out of step with the views of the American public and out of step with the practices of almost all the states in the country. Thank you. Does anyone else want to I comment can, on that? Sure, I think. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I can just add to that. In Louisiana, uh, in the past 20 years, we've only had three executions. And out of those three, one voluntarily uh, waived his rights to appeal. Um, and so when we look at the South, we think even in the South, uh, we we may think that the South is, you know, execution, execution, execution. But Louisiana is right here in the middle of the South, and we've only executed three people in 20 years. Uh, but on the flip side of that, we've always almost had almost 10 exonerations in the last 15 years. Uh, and uh, and we're I, and I, I'm, I'm not I want to get into legality of those that's been uh, commuted from debt to life, but the debt penalty even in Louisiana in the South is almost non-existent. Thank you. Thank you, Sharif. We have also a question from the from the audience on, on lethal injections. Uh, as some of you may know, the, the European Union banned the export of uh, drugs used in lethal injections. And at the same time, many pharmaceutical companies do not want their, their drugs used use for, for executions. And the question from the audience relates to how do then governors use, uh, sorry, obtain lethal 
uh, lethal drugs for the for the lethal injection. I don't know if Paul, from the perspective of Ohio, or Robert, or Sharif. Sure. Going to. Uh, maybe I can tell you about what's going on in Ohio. Uh, the drug companies have made it clear to the governor of Ohio that uh, the, that the state Ohio should not be using any drugs to use in lethal injections and. The, the governor and the, and the folks in the state of Ohio have, have followed that uh, notion. Uh, uh, and what's happened as well is that because drugs have not been available, such as anesthetic drugs, which have been used in uh, executions throughout the years, because they haven't been available, uh, drugs that have been used in Ohio include a sedative called midazolam, which has been used in other states as well, but that has very, very serious problems. It doesn't anesthetize somebody. The person does feel the pain of the execution and it's, it's horrific. Uh, and I think what has happened then, especially in Ohio, is that folks have recognized and the governor has recognized that under the circumstances, you can't be using these other drugs uh, to try to execute people. So uh, lethal injection uh, as a general matter has uh, been limited by the accessibility to drugs and uh, the drug companies by letting their voices be known that they, that the drug shouldn't be used. And that's a, something that the, the, the European Union has, has supported for many years and has been a good thing in order to stop uh, executions from occurring uh, uh, when, when drugs haven't been available. Robert, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, I think one of the critical things that folks don't understand uh, is that lethal injection um, makes an execution look like it's peaceful, and it isn't. Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, a review of hundreds of autopsies with lethal injection uh, shows that uh, in a vast majority of cases, uh, the prisoner has what's called pulmonary edema. Uh, that is fluid in the lungs frothing uh, oftentimes out of the lungs into the airways. Uh, the, the judge in the Ohio case who heard all the evidence likened that to being waterboarded, suffocated, uh, and then chemically burned at the stake when the, uh, the first drug, midazolam, is administered, followed by a paralytic that prevents the people who are watching uh, from seeing what the prisoner is actually experiencing. Uh, and then the third drug, typically potassium chloride, um, literally burns through the prisoner's veins uh, until it stops the heart. Uh, I, I think when we talk about the way executions get carried out, uh, states did not initially intend to be torturing prisoners to death. Uh, and what is so disturbing is now that the scientific evidence, the medical evidence is so overwhelming, uh, now that their method of execution of choice uh, has been proven to be torturous, uh, the American courts have invented new standards for reviewing these cases of torture uh, and making it virtually impossible for uh, prisoners to obtain review of the method in which they're being killed. Uh, if you are a country that is if country, uh, this is not something that should be going on. Uh, and the voice of the European Union uh, as, um, as a bastion of human rights, uh, as a promoter of human de dignity and human decency, uh, has been extremely important uh, in pointing out to the United States and to the rest of the world just how inhumane this practice is. Thank you, Robert, and thank you, Paul. Uh, I want to also uh, remind the audience that you can submit your questions uh, using the Q&A chat feature in Zoom, or you can come and speak to the microphone, and I will give you the floor. We have another question from the audience about why do you think, addressed to all the panelists, maybe Sharif in particular, how many wrongful convictions occur in capital crimes? It is racism, prejudice, or uh, are law enforcement under pressure to assign blame and to resolve a, a crime? Well, um, I, I think it's it's all of those reasons uh, and, and more. Uh, and I, I, I'm just gonna say from my personal experience, um, 
I know had I been a 16 year old white kid uh, from the middle of upper class neighborhood that was playing organized basketball on a team and I had 20 other uh, white kids that were on my team and opposing team, I would have not have been arrested without a doubt in my mind. So I do know race plays a factor. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, you get these high profile cases uh, and a lot of the prosecutors, uh, it's a political game. You know, you win these high profile cases, then you're moving up in a political ladder of, uh, of your own career. So then it becomes a win at all costs. Uh, and, and the same goes for, for, uh, for the police department. Uh, you know, when you have in, in particular New Orleans, a high crime area, high crime city, a lot of these crimes and these murders have to be solved. Um, so I, I look at it as a, as a whole host of all of those things and more. And that's what the evidence I would is say. No, go ahead, Paul. Oh, I would just simply say it kind of goes back to what I said earlier. I think there are a, a, a number of factors that lead to these improper convictions and appropriate death sentences. In some cases, it will be the prosecutor overreaching. Sometimes it will be... Uh, the law enforcement trying to, to solve a crime and pinning it on somebody. Other times, the prosecution is it's doing its job properly. The law enforcement is doing its job properly. It may be that you end up with a witness who has some bad evidence, like Ruth recognized, that is testifying, uh, that gets somebody convicted and sentenced to death. You, you then may add in uh, an attorney who's overwhelmed with the case and can't uh, prove the falsity of the evidence that's put up. So it's really is a combination. I, I think that um, you're, you're, you can't give any one particular uh, constellation of factors that leads to the wrong conviction, but all those different factors in different uh, situations definitely show up. You know, there, there are some cases that are just plain mistakes. Sorry, but, Robert, first and then sorry. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, there are some cases that are just plain mistakes, and that's one of the ultimate problems with capital punishment, because we're human and you can never eliminate the possibility of human error. Uh, but when we look at the more than 170 exonerations uh, of people wrongfully convicted and sentenced to death in the United States uh, just since, uh, since the 1970s, uh, we see that there are certain patterns. Uh, uh, prosecutorial misconduct is the overwhelming um, largest cause of wrongful capital convictions. Uh, and usually it occurs in combination with false testimony, false identification uh, of, uh, of a defendant. The National Registry of Exonerations just released a report on uh, misconduct and exonerations and found that across the United States, uh, misconduct is present uh, in more than half of all exonerations, uh, and it is more present the more serious a case is. Uh, they also found that misconduct is more likely to occur if you have an African-American defendant. So in capital cases where there are exonerations uh, with black defendants, you end up seeing misconduct 87% of the time. When, when a case is a bad case, when you look at the facts and they're horrible, uh, there's increased public pressure to solve it, uh, and police are uh, tend towards tunnel vision. They focus in on one person uh, and they follow it from there. Uh, that results in, um, in errors throughout the rest of the process. But you can fix a lot of things that are wrong with evidence. Uh, what, what you can't fix is the way that racism affects the system, and what you can't fix uh, is the way misconduct occurs. And that is overwhelmingly the cause of most of the uh, uh, wrongful capital convictions in the United States. Thank you, Robert. Ruth, did you want to add anything? Yes, I would just add that I think this is so much more rampant and prevalent than people are aware. Um, many of the facts of these cases don't ever come to light. I think Just Mercy is an example of Walter McMillan's case is an example of what might have happened had the Equal Justice Initiative not taken his case. That's a nonprofit that doesn't, isn't able to take every case in Alabama. The state of Alabama provides no money for the post-conviction um, system for people on death row. So the office got involved in that case. What if it hadn't? Would the case have been investigated? Would all of this have come to light? Um, or would we, you know, would Mr. McMillan have been executed? 
Um, how many cases are there like that out there that don't get to see the light, that are not investigated, that don't have lawyers who have the experience, the resources, the expertise to take these cases on? It's a horrifying thought. And I think it is much more rampant than we're aware. Thank you, Ruth. And I think you have touched upon a very a topic that a bit all of the speakers have uh, have also mentioned that is the arbitrariness of the death penalty geographically it's arbitrary it's arbitrary in the sense of whether a person gets actually exonerated from death row or or not so i I really appreciate the, the work that uh, that you are doing from your different capacities, research, lawyers, or or advocates. And and I have a question. Maybe we have uh, three more minutes to to answer that to, to all of you from from the European Union. That is that. What do you think should be the added value of the international community in the in the death penalty debate in the in the US? Because you have a lot of domestic actors also that that work for that for that. Maybe Robert, do you want to or? Oh, sure. Well, you know, as, as I was saying a little bit earlier, um, the European Union has become uh, the conscience of the world uh, with respect to human rights. Um, I, I would add Canada, Australia, uh, and, uh, and and several other countries. Uh, but the United States has, uh, over the course of the last several years, uh, moved from being a country that stressed human rights and, and the value of human life uh, to being a major human rights violator. Uh, and I think that uh, in promoting human decency and human dignity, uh, we need the international community. We did a study um, earlier this year uh, and looking at international standards for how long somebody should be on death row. And there are international human rights treaties and international court decisions that say that it is inappropriate to leave somebody on death row in solitary confinement for an extended period of time. We found that there are more than 1,300 Americans uh, on death row in this country who have been there for 20 years or more in solitary confinement, which is a huge human rights violation. This is something that would not be considered anywhere uh, without the views of the world community. Uh, and I think it's important to hold the United States to account because we do like to think that we have one of the best judicial systems uh, in the world, but it doesn't do any good if the judges are not allowed to reach issues. It doesn't do any good when you have justice that's denied for such a long period of time, and it doesn't do a whole lot of good when you have people who are innocent, who've been framed, who've been sitting on death rows for 20, 30, and in recent instances, 40 years before they're exonerated. Uh, this is something that the European Union has been very good at bringing to the world's attention. Uh, and that kind of public pressure on human rights violators uh, is critical to bringing about reforms. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And, and unless anyone wants to, wants to say something so I, else I think, to uh, Go ahead. I, I think I'll just uh, I'll end with it with a quote from Dr. King uh, when he said that justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, and whatever affects one directly affects us all indirectly. Um, and and that statement holds true in every aspect of society. We are all uh, mutually tied, interconnected uh, with humanity. And so while the, uh, while the European Union um, is at the forefront internationally, uh, bringing an issue to, it, to injustice in our country, it affects everybody indirectly all over the, all over the world. Thank you, Sharif. I think that's a really nice quote to, to end our program today. Uh, thank you very much to, to all the speakers for taking the time to, to share your, your work with, uh, with us and also to the public for joining us today and for, for your questions. From my point of view, I think we had a terrific panel, but I'm probably biased, but I hope you also enjoyed. And if you don't mind, there is a sort of opinion poll now that will appear in the screen as, as we conclude. Thank you very much and have a, have a nice day.